بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My name is Imam Zaid Shakir I'm here at the Zaytuna Institute and on behalf of Zaytuna Institute as staff, workers, scholars we'd like to welcome you to this the first in a series of monthly video cast by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf During each episode Sheikh Hamza will present timely advice to the general community and share his reflections on the prophetic guidance. We pray that this video cast will reach billions of people and be a source of guidance and direction, clarity for multitudes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-Ali al-Azim Alhamdulillah I first want to thank Imam Zaid for his words and his efforts May Allah bless him and increase him in tawfiq and secondly thank everyone who has been supportive of our work our joint work as well as the work of Zaytuna Institute we have a lot of really good people working there we have a lot of great students that are coming there and also uh, increasingly teachers that are of a very high caliber and we hope to see inshallah in the future uh, something very very significant one of the things that I'd like to say is that an immense amount of work has gone into Zaytuna that we're, this is our tenth year uh, almost and um, basically a lot of groundwork has been done particularly in the last few years and so I'm really looking forward and I think a lot of people are very excited about what's going to happen in the very near future but a lot of that is dependent on continued support and inshallah increased support so we really may Allah bless all the people that are helping us to achieve these goals secondly I think this is definitely a difficult time for Muslims um, it, it's arguable that there's never been a time that it wasn't difficult for Muslims but we should always keep in mind Allah's words in the ma'al usri yusra, with hardship is ease, uh, that they go together, and there's an immense amount of facilitation as well as hardship. So I think it's really important for us to to focus on a lot of those blessings and recognize that the challenges of the world are always there, and that what Allah is challenging us to do is to rise up to that level uh, of the challenge and really overcome these challenges. And secondly, that the Muslims themselves, I mean, there was a recent article in the Herald Tribune, it, sa it said uh, it was a, this is a hard time to be called Ahmed in America. But my response to that title is, it's a good time to be called Ahmed anywhere, in any place, in any time. So I think people should be proud of their Islam. The Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya recently, when he was asked in Denmark uh, about uh, one of these terrorists or what this that or the other he just said why are you asking me what does he have to do with me uh, I, we're, we're from a Muslim community of 1.4 billion people and what some individuals do does not reflect on our community and I'm not guilty of any crime and I've done nothing wrong so I don't I take objection to the question and I think it's important for Muslims to have that understanding Muslims generally have done nothing wrong and uh, the Quran says I swear by this land and you are a, a legitimate citizen of this land so we're all here on the earth together and it's important for Muslims not to forget that that uh, while it is a difficult time it's still a time of great facilitation and ease from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and most of us are in immense blessings and we should really count those blessings so secondly um, I, inshallah I'm gonna uh, look at some of these hadith in the content of character and this is a collection of hadith that was done by Sheikh Al-Amin Ali uh, Mazru'i uh, from a very notable family in uh, East Africa 
and he's the father of a very uh, notable scholar in America called Ali Mazroui, Dr. Ali Mazroui. And he, he did this collection because he wanted to emphasize the ethical character of the Prophet Sallallahu and in a time, in an era in which our Prophet is being maligned constantly. And not only maligned by his enemies, but also poorly represented by his friends, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think it's important that we get back to the root of our prophetic teaching. And it's important to remember that his core teaching has two important principles. The first one is correct understanding, how we understand the world and how we align our understanding with reality so that our actual thoughts and perceptions of the world are congruent with the reality of the world as opposed to being in a delusional state which is the state of the vast majority of human beings and the Quran warns us لَا يُغْرَنَّكَ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Don't be deluded by the one who deludes who, that element in the world, shaitan, that's puts people into delusional states from both humans and also the, the, uh, the spirit world. And the second aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu core prophetic teaching is right action. And right action is predicated upon right understanding. Now, ethics is the science of right action. It, ethics is the tool by which we use in order to have a standard or a criterion for what is right and what is wrong. And there are two basic branches of ethics. There, there's a moral ethics that, that is rooted in what we would probably call natural law. And then there's prophetic ethics or revelatory ethics, which is rooted in the idea of a revelation from God. The natural ethics is something many, many people agree on. Things like honesty, virtue, all these things. These are universal principles and they're important. But in Islam, what we have is a criterion for right and wrong. And that criterion is, is called a furqan. It's the ability to discriminate between right and wrong. And it's not always an easy thing to do, but in the Quran we are promised that if you have this God consciousness, Allah will give you this furqan and give you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And one of the problems that I see and, it, and really consider it to be probably one of the gravest problems in the Muslim world today and amongst Muslims generally is that we have fallen far from the ethical stature that we once had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummah ukhrijat linnas. You were the best ummah. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof. You enjoin virtue. And you prohibit vice. You enjoin what? And it's very interesting that, it, it's, that, that you command to, you enjoin upon others because you yourselves are practicing it. And then you also tell people not to do what is wrong. And you believe in God. And th these are the qualities that give people uh, uh, this, this uh, elected status. But the idea of enjoining right means that you're practicing it because p people often think ta'muruna uh, bil ma'ruf means that you enjoin right with your tongue. That's not always the state. The Arabs say lisan al-hal ablaghu min lisan al-maqal. The tongue of one's condition is far more eloquent than the tongue uh, of speech. In other words, that there's a commanding or an enjoining right that is the embodiment of right. When the Prophet uh, they asked his wife, how would you describe the Prophet, his ethical character? She said, Kana khuluqu al Quran. His character was the Quran. In other words, he was the embodiment of the word. So if you're not the embodiment of the word, the word becomes hollow. And, and that's part of the problem is our, our, our Muslim community, we often fail to embody the, the high principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And when people see us, they, 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 they don't see us as people with moral capital. And when they see us bankrupt, the Arabs say, فَاقِدُ شَيْنْ لَا Somebody who doesn't possess something can't give it. So at the root of our, a real crisis in our community is a crisis of ethics. We have a crisis of ethics. There was, uh, I, I, recently uh, there was a, uh, a news broadcast and, and they, what they did is they took a hidden camera and put it in, in a car and they went to valets and, and what they found is a lot of valets were rummaging in people's 
cars to steal things and people hand you their keys to a valet and they never think about anything and there was recently a man who went and stalked a woman he, he got the key to her house from he was a valet he got the key to the house from the car and went and stalked her but in, in, in this news thing they had a Muslim man who was the valet who was rummaging through to look for money and it's just sad that 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 we have and every community has bad people but unfortunately we have a lot of Muslims that have lost that sense of ethics of just having a real criterion of right and wrong and not simply knowing it or understanding it, but actually practicing it and and we need to revive that tradition of right action in our community and right action like I said needs to be predicated with right understanding so the Prophet said these hadiths that uh, Sheikh Mazroui actually uh, compiled were to to really uh, try to inculcate in people these meanings so that they would begin to practice them in their lives and the first one that he mentions is uh, a hadith related by Imam Al-Tabarani one of the great muhaddithun uh, of the early period qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-islam nadhif fatanadhafu fa innahu la yadkhul al-jannata illa nadhif which means Islam is clean, so cleanse yourselves, for only the cleansed shall enter paradise. And what's beautiful about, um, among the many things that are beautiful about Islam, one, one of the beauties of Islam is that all of religious texts that deal with Islamic law begin with the chapter on purity. That's the first chapter, at tahara And tahara is the, the, the essence of our religion we fast uh, in order to purify ourselves we pay zakat in order to purify our wealth we pray in order to purify our our hearts and our souls uh, and before we can pray we have to do a ritual outward purification which symbolizes the the, the cleaning of the souls from sins because the Prophet Sallallahu said that when you do your wudu when you wash your mouth with the water the sins come out of the mouth which is why in the Shafi'i Madhab uh, some of the Shafi'i ulama consider the water of wudu to be najis, it's impure because of the sins that have come off. So the spiritual uh, state of man is cleansed and even though it's symbolically with water, it's nonetheless cleansed uh, by water. So this idea of being clean and cleanly, in, in English we say cleanliness is next to godliness. At-taharatu minat iman, there's a saying of the Arabs, that pur purification or purity is from faith itself. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And this has to do with outward cleanliness. The Prophet ﷺ was very concerned with hygiene. He always wore perfume. So he actually, he smelt good, even though he had a natural perfume. In fact, we, we know that some of the women used to, once he was sleeping in a house of, of one of the Ansar women, and he woke up and she was she had a little bottle and she was collecting beads because it was a hot day she was collecting beads of sweat from his brow in the bottle and he said what are you doing and she said ya rasulullah your sweat is the best scent i've ever smelt and so we use it um, for perfume and and so that that because he was so pure that even his sweat had a beautiful smell and, and so, but the Prophet was, he, they said, one man said, I wanted to see how many times he brushed his teeth with the stick, and he followed him, and he said he got to around 17, and he stopped counting, because the Prophet Sallallahu kept his teeth clean. The Prophet was very concerned about his outward appearance, and once he was looking in a mirror before he went out to the people, and Aisha said, do you look in the mirror? And she thought, it, you know, is, is that from vanity, or she's asking a question, why? Uh, was he looking in the mirror and he said I was commanded by my Lord to do this to go out to the people in a pleasant way and so that's one aspect of the hadith is that the outward cleanliness is very important it's very sad to see Muslims when they smile beautiful smile but then you can see their teeth they haven't cleaned their teeth or washed their teeth uh, and their Prophet Sallallahu is somebody who taught oral hygiene he taught uh, using the to floss he actually floss he said that even the angels are, are bothered by food between the teeth of somebody praying. 
and he used to use a palm fiber to clean through his teeth and it's in the Risala of Ibn Abi Zayl al-Qayrawani, one of the great Maliki texts, is that Takhlil uh, al-Asnan is from the Sunnah to actually floss your teeth. So these, these are the qualities that the Prophet ﷺ inculcated in his followers. It was an obligation to take ghusl at least once a week. And that's in a, a culture where water was very precious. So that shows you the importance. Uh, and so that aspect is very important. But the hadith is obviously a deeper meaning, which is also the spiritual or the cleaning of the exterior. You can have a lot of people out there that are very clean outwardly, but inside they're filthy. They have dirty thoughts. They uh, have uh, impure hearts, they're filled with envy, they're filled with pride, they're filled with corruption, they're filled with hatred, they're filled with resentment. They have all these diseases of the heart and they've done nothing to... If somebody, if somebody has chest pain, they go right to a doctor. But if they have symptoms of pride, they don't even think about it. And the diseases of the heart, the spiritual diseases are far more dangerous than the physical disease because the physical disease of the heart will kill your body but the spiritual disease of the heart will kill your soul and in the end of the day uh, the body will die anyway but the soul is eternal and, and if you kill your soul in this life then you suffer the consequence in the next life so the, the spiritual idea of purifying oneself is absolutely essential in the Islamic tradition of, of, of tamlif, of this, this cleanliness of the internal state of, 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 of the body, of the body, our spiritual body, of the soul of man and woman. And so it's very important uh, for people to see that, that nobody will enter paradise unless they're in this state of purity. And that's why the Quran says, uh, On the day when no wealth or no children will be of avail. They will not avail anyone. Only those who bring to God a pure heart this pure heart. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ told us to polish our hearts. He said, Kulu shayin yasla. It's, it's an extraordinary hadith. Everything oxidizes. Everything is corruptible. Everything uh, will diminish in the world. Everything. It doesn't matter if it's plant, if it's vegetable, if it's mineral, if it's uh, flesh and blood. It doesn't matter. Everything will uh, diminish. And, and he said, everything oxidizes. And, and he said, حتى القلب, even the heart uh, co it co corrodes. It corrodes. And he said, وَإِنَّ صَقَالَتُهُ ذِكْرُ الله. And the polishing of the heart, in other words, to prevent that... If you have a, if, if you have a, uh, a, a, a silver plate that you have things on or something like that, uh, or a tray or something like that, anything metal, what happens is, not silver, but, but brass and things uh, that are more, because gold and silver are the least uh, corruptible metals, which is why they're so precious. Gold is, is, doesn't corrode like other metals. So if you have that, you have to polish it. You have to keep your silverware polished because it will begin to corrode. And, and that's, the, the Prophet ﷺ is giving us a metaphor for the heart, that the heart too corrodes. And the way that you prevent that is by polishing the heart. And the polishing of the heart is the remembrance of God. And the remembrance of God will put you in a state of awareness of God. And that's why if you're a valet and you get into a car, even though the person's not looking, you know God is looking. You know Allah is there. And, and that will prevent you from doing what's wrong. And if you don't have that consciousness awareness, which doesn't mean somebody that doesn't believe in God can't be morally ethical and all these things at one level but those people are, are uh, unusual people it's not the norm amongst people the the reality is the, the the grounding of ethics is in an awareness of some sacred order in the world and that there's accountability and that's what we believe and so it's not to deny that there aren't honest people out there that are secular or whatever I've met people that I've seem to me to be very honest but this is something that is rooted in a, an awareness of God and an awareness of accountability that we will be taken to account for our actions and so it's very important so that is a beautiful hadith and inshallah may Allah give us the ability to implement the the true meanings of these uh, hadiths in our lives and again I want to thank everybody for supporting Zaytuna I, I really hope that you continue to support us, increase your support, 
if, if not us, then somebody else finds something that really uh, you have passion in your heart for, that, for the sake of God, and, and set out and, and do that, or set out on your own course and achieve something for yourself. But do something. That's the most important thing that I can say is that you have to do something. If you're supporting us, we have an immense appreciation and gratitude, first to our Lord, but secondly to those who our Lord has made the means by which He is supporting our work, insha'Allah. Wa jazakum Allah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.